These will be the group problems for lecture exam one. So we'll just look at each problem and kind of go through them. The first problem asks you to outline the four basic themes of physiology and give it specific examples for each theme. Uh, before we start that, it's probably not a bad idea to explain group problems because this is the first set we have. Group problems are designed to pick important concepts that will appear on the exam and give us a chance to look at them in a little more detail than we did in lecture. It is not necessarily the most important things on the exam, although certainly they are of higher importance. Uh, a number of years ago, I did this during a group problem set in, in a face-to-face -face class where each group got a problem, hence the name group problems, and their job was to figure out the answers and then present it to the class as sort of a review for the exam. As each group was presenting, I had the exam with me and marked off any points they mentioned. And they mentioned directly a little over 50 points. Uh, I think it was 53 points, if I remember correctly for a 100-point exam. So basically, it's going to make up probably about half the content. If you only know group problems, then you're going to get an F, right? Because you only get 50 points or so. And if you don't know group problems, you're going to get at least an F because those would make up about probably half the questions. To be honest, I did not go through our exam this time around to check to see what was on it and what wasn't. And certainly there are other things that could appear on this that are not uh, here because I've only picked six because typically we have six groups of students in a face-to-face -face course. So that doesn't mean there's not other things that are important, I guess, is the best way to do it. Uh, a good way to kind of think about these or to make sure you understand them and see if there's any other ways you can look at them or any other information you can gather from them and any extensions you might see for a lecture exam and uh, you know i've had a student a couple years ago that literally wrote out the answer to every group problem by hand uh, it she said it took her a while but uh, it really helped in terms of studying so these are important but not the only thing i guess is a good way to to do it so back to number one the first group problem asks about the four basic themes of physiology. Uh, there's no specific, specific order to them, but uh, let's go through the four basic themes. These are things that we will see every day throughout the semester. And not surprisingly, we've already talked about many of these things, uh, which again reinforces the idea of basic themes. Uh, number one is structure function relationships and basically that's the integration of structure and function so how does structure determine the function and it's a very important aspect of physiology uh, and there's kind of three sub components this is the most complex one that's why i put it first uh, the first component is molecular interaction and that's the ability of molecules to interact based on three-dimensional structure and that's vital to integration. So as an example, ligands, some people say ligands, right? Binder receptors that have the proper three-dimensional shape, right? So in order for molecules to interact, there has to be the correct three-dimensional shape. Uh, when we talked about receptor uh, properties, uh, one of the major receptor properties is specificity, and that's that three-dimensional shape. So molecular interaction is very important. The second thing is mechanical properties. So mechanical properties influence their function by determining how the system will function itself. Uh, you should think of some examples on your own if you can, but a great example is that ligaments attach bone to bone, and they tend to be fairly rigid. They don't stretch much. And depending on what type of ligament it is, they might not really stretch at all. Um, while tendons, which are similar, they attach muscle to bone, and they have a lot more uh, elastic fibers in it, so they have a lot more stretch. Uh, 
And that makes sense in terms of how they function. So that structure function relationship, what we call mechanical properties. Uh, you know, another place to look at it would be in the lungs, right? So your lungs have the ability to inflate and deflate, right? They're very elastic uh, in terms of how they function, but uh, certain diseases uh, compromise elasticity. It makes it more difficult for people to breathe. So that's another good example of mechanical properties. Um, the last one for this category is called compartmentation. Uh, many of us would call it in everyday life compartmentalization, I think. And it's the presence of separate compartments, often but not always, usually separated by membranes, that allow areas to specialize functions. And you could even take it even further and say, okay, this allows for specific functions. So examples of compartmentation would be organelles within a cell or even the sub sections of the mitochondria like uh, the Christi versus the matrix or you want to go more global it could be the organ systems right each organ system is separated uh, to allow for a more specific function right so the 10 organ systems we're responsible for on the first exam is another example of compartmentation so all three of those molecular interaction mechanical properties and compartmentation make up the structure function relationships the second component, the basic theme of physiology, is biological energy. This one's pretty simple. All living processes require a continuous input of energy. If you want to kind of define energy, the classical definition is energy is the capacity to do work. Uh, the type of work we do in the body typically is transport work, chemical work, and mechanical work. Uh, so energy is used to transport molecules uh, across membranes or against gradients. It's used to synthesize or break down molecules. And the most obvious for most people, uh, use of energy is for movement. So that's number two, biological energy. Uh, number three is communication. Cells need to communicate and helps to coordinate the body in terms of how it uh, works together and so communication is essential to have normal function uh, we'll talk later about communication but there are two basic modes of communication in the human body electrical and chemical and we have various sensors located in our body that are sensitive to electrical or chemical information and that allows us to signal uh, from one place to another um, again, this information flow is very important, but especially important in moving across cell membranes and getting information from the internal to external environment, or more importantly, from the external to the internal environment, requires this information transfer across cell membranes. Uh, remember, cell membranes are selectively permeable, and they allow some substances to pass while prohibiting others. In order to pass directly, you have to be small and nonpolar, generally speaking. But, you know, we can move other molecules with the presence of proteins through channels or uh, transporters or, or things like that. So that's communication. Uh, the last one, and certainly the most basic one to physiology, is homeostasis. If you asked physiologists to describe physiology in one word, uh, I'd say at least 97% of them would choose the word homeostasis. And homeostasis says the body systems work together to maintain a constant internal environment. Uh, homeostasis is really defined that way. Uh, the internal working conditions of the body are best suited to work in a consistent operating range. Uh, homeostasis is accomplished primarily through negative feedback mechanisms which return the variable back to the set point if it you know, deviates from the, the normal. And you know, it is probably the most important of the things in physiology. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this, if you learn only one thing a semester, learn that homeostasis is a constant internal environment and maintaining that is hugely important. So that's concept number one.
Concept number two asks to summarize the basic components of a cell and look at the structural and functional components of each. So, you know, there's a couple ways to look at this question, and you know, we'll start very broad and then narrow our focus. Um, typically, the cell can be organized into four main parts. The four main parts of the cell include the cytosol, inclusions, cell membrane, and organelles. Let's take a look in a little more detail about each one of those. So the cytosol is the liquid portion of the cell. Uh, it's also known as the intracellular fluid, or ICF. It's actually a semi-gelatinous fluid that uh, bathes the organelles, and it helps to do a number of different things. Uh, water helps to stabilize temperature. It's a great uh, way to do that. Uh, it allows for movements. Things move very easily in water. It serves as a place for chemical reactions to, to occur. Uh, so that is uh, you know, very important in terms of, of the body. Uh, a couple things though to remind you of, it's not cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is all the cellular contents, including the cytosol and organelles, although some books and authorities leave the nucleus out while others include it. So um, cytosol is the liquid portion of the cell. Cytoplasm is all the junk in the cell. It's probably the best way to think about it. Uh, you can have inclusions. Inclusions are typically found in the cytosol, but they don't have to be there. So substances you could find in the cytosol, such as uh, melanin or glycogen or fatty acids, uh, would be considered to be inclusions. Uh, the organelles, uh, the organelles are uh, very important in terms of how the body functions. Uh, the organelles are specialized area. Again, we mentioned they're an example of compartmentation, and they allow us to specialize in certain areas of the cell to perform specific functions. You may have not done this before, but I think it's pretty convenient to divide the organelles into two basic types, what we call membranous organelles and non-membranous organelles. And it's very simple in terms of their definition. Membranous organelles have a membrane, so that phospholipid bilayer, and non-membranous organelles do not have a phospholipid bilayer, and so they're in direct contact with the cytosol. So let's get non-membranous organelles first. We'll divide the non-membranous organelles into two types. Uh, the first type we'll call the RNA type, right? So there's the RNA type. And the second type we'll call the protein type. And the protein type are made from proteins, and the RNA type are made from RNA. So there are two RNA type non-membranous organelles we have to worry about. Um, the first are called ribosomes. Ribosomes can be found in various places in the cell. They can be floating, floating free in the cytoplasm, or they can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, specifically, when ribosomes are attached to a portion of the endoplasmic reticulum, it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or RER. Uh, ribosomes, no matter where they're located, their job is protein synthesis. They help the body make protein, so they serve as kind of like the, the placeholder in which to make a protein. Uh, the second non-membranous organelles are vaults, and vaults are discovered recently. Uh, we know they're all in, found in all eukaryotic cell. Their function is unknown. Uh, it's probably the only time this semester if you were to ask, you know, what's the function of vaults? Uh, the answer would be, I don't know. And in that case, because nobody knows, it's uh, an appropriate answer. Um, we do know that they're associated with protein fibers and different types of movement. Um, and also, they can be related to certain types of cancer or drug resistance in certain cells. But outside of that, we really don't know what their function is, to be honest. So um, if you look at them in terms of um, high-powered microscopes, they literally look like little beer kegs. Or, you know, that's like those, if you've ever seen the root beer barrel candies, uh, that's what they look like. So um, those are called vaults. So ribosomes and vaults are non-membranous organelles that are the RNA type. The protein type non-membranous organelles uh, include primarily your cytoskeleton elements. These cytoskeleton elements, uh, because they're made out of protein, uh, 
uh, are made up of rods and tubes. The rods are called microfilaments, and the tubes are called microtubules. And their primary function um, is for structure, uh, motion, and movement. We'll narrow the cytoskeleton down into four basic structures of the cytoskeleton. Uh, flagella. Uh, flagella generally come singularly, um, and they tend to be long and a whip-like tail, uh, although there are some sperm that have, uh, you know, two flagella. Uh, and usually in humans, the role of flagella is to move the entire cell. Uh, the only human cell with flagella uh, is sperm, and that's their job is to move through the female reproductive tract to fertilize the egg. Cilia are somewhat similar. Um, usually, though, uh, if you find one cilium, that's singular, uh, you typically find multiple cilia. Uh, they tend to be shorter and hair-like, and generally in humans, they move things across the cell surface. Now, in other organisms, especially in microorganisms, they move the entire organism. But for humans, um, it generally moves things across the cell surface. So we see cilia in uh, a number of places, like uh, within our respiratory tract or in uh, you know, fallopian tubes for, for uterine tubes. Uh, whatever you want to call them for um, females. So uh, that's cilia. Uh, the other one you might not have heard of before, it's called kinesin. Uh, kinesin means move. Um, and so kinesin are small protein molecules within a cell that work like little railroad tracks to move substances in the cell. Um, there's also a similar protein called dynin, uh, which actually is kinesin kind of backwards. Uh, won't get into it too much uh, right now, but we'll talk about those a little later. Uh, and then the last one are centrioles. And centrioles are the little proteins that help uh, the cell undergo mitosis and guides chromosomes so they go to the appropriate pole. So those are protein-like organelles. Uh, they're non-membranous. They're the cytoskeleton, the neck of flagella, cilia, kinesin, and centrioles. Now we have the membranous organelles, and the membranous organelles are called membranous organelles again because they have a membrane. So they have this phospholipid. They tend to be sort of hollow at the center, and again, it allows things to separate uh, the compartmentation idea again and allows specialization for space or time. Uh, in no particular order, uh, we have uh, the nucleus. Now, by definition, uh, nuclei are not in what we call prokaryotic cells, but since humans are eukaryotic cells, then we're going to have a nucleus, normally speaking. Now, some cells no longer have a nucleus in humans, where it's been lost through development, like a red blood cell. And some cells can have multiple nuclei. A best example would be skeletal muscle uh, is multinucleated, although... Uh, uh, transitional epithelium within like the bladder uh, can also have a, a pair of nuclei in a single cell. But most cells have one nucleus um, in the human body. Uh, it is a double phospholipid bilayer, so it's got two layers, and we call that the nuclear envelope. Um, in the nucleus, um, we have DNA in a form that's called chromatin, and that's the form of DNA that we see most of the time. When a cell gets ready to divide, the DNA becomes condensed and um, now becomes chromosomes. And, and not a bad way to, to think about that is it's the same DNA, it's just what shape it's in. So chromatid looks like um, spaghetti noodles. So there are these long strands, um, while chromosomes look more like macaroni noodles, these very distinct uh, often represented in books as X's, right, uh, which make it easier to divide. And so, you know, kind of to look at it from a, a different way, if I said, okay, I'm going to cook spaghetti and I'm going to cook, you know, noodles, and then I'm going to, you know, put one, both in separate pots, and I said, okay, I want you to count out 46 spaghetti uh, noodles or 46 macaroni noodles, which one are you going to do? And you're probably going to pick the macaroni because they're nice, easy, distinct um, uh, units that you can count very easily. While if you looked at the spaghetti, 
it can twist and tangle and, and become very uh, difficult to separate potentially. And that's why, good way to, way to think about it, why cells condense the DNA into chromosomes before they divide because it makes it easier to uh, separate and go where they need to. Um, it's also the control center, right? It, the DNA is really a cookbook for making proteins. Um, the nuclear membrane does have pores that allows RNA and other things to uh, exit the nucleus and to make proteins. The uh, mitochondria, uh, my favorite organelle, um, has a double outer membrane as well. Um, it helps to isolate reactions. Uh, mitochondria are an example of what we call symbiotic evolution. Sim refers to together. So symbiotic, symbiotic evolution refers to the idea that mitochondria wants their own separate organism. And it invaded the cell, um, helped organisms to make more energy by being able to use oxygen in that process. And they eventually became incorporated as part of the cell. Um, they have their own DNA, and that's one of the evidences for the symbiotic evolution. Uh, mitochondria are also an example of what we call maternal inheritance. Uh, all your mitochondria comes from your mom. And uh, when the sperm enters the egg, it's only the genetic material that enters from the father. And so mom has all the other components there. Uh, it's said to be aerobic, which means it really only functions in the presence of oxygen. And its major function is produce ATP. And so that's our big energy producer that makes the most ATP uh, in terms of the body. Uh, next one would be endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum, loosely translated, means the network of junk inside a cell. Not quite, but pretty close. What it is, it's a series of membrane folds connected to the nucleus. As I mentioned before, it can come in two forms. The one form I mentioned uh, is known as the rough, uh, sometimes very few people, but occasionally it's called granular uh, endoplasmic reticulum. It has ribosomes, and it's because it has ribosomes, and ribosomes make proteins. Its job is to make proteins. There's also a smooth portion which doesn't have ribosomes, and because there's no ribosomes, we know it doesn't make proteins. And its job is primarily to make lipids, and uh, it helps to detoxify the cell. Uh, so that's the endoplasmic reticulum. The Golgi apparatus, or sometimes known as the Golgi body, uh, consists of a series of these curved sacs. So they look like pancakes, almost sitting on top of each other. And I like to think of it as an intercellular UPS. Uh, what it does is it uh, modifies, sorts, packages, and ships various substances. Some of those substances are shipped to other parts of the cell, and some of those substances, depending on what they are, are shipped out of the cell and to go someplace else in the body. So that's the Golgi. Uh, still on membranous organelles, right? Organelles that have a cell membrane. The next one are called lysosomes. Uh, lysosomes are general in terms of what they destroy or digest. They're vesicles, which means they're these membrane packages that contain inside of them a whole bunch of different digestive enzymes. And a few of them have over a couple hundred of these enzymes. What they do is they engulf an invader, something that they uh, determine in their body that needs to be destroyed, and they destroy it with their um, enzymes inside. So they're kind of like, you know, keep you free from disease, toxins, debris, things like that. They're also important in terms of what's called autolysis. And Lysis means to break apart, and auto means self. So this is when the cell destroys itself by breaking down and replacing the old or damaged, worn out cellular components. This is actually as good because it helps to keep the debris from, from building up. So generally speaking, if it's controlled correctly, it's a good, important thing we need to do in terms of the body. The last membranous organelle are peroxisomes. And peroxisomes are kind of similar to lysosomes, except they're much more specific. And what they do is they destroy uh, long-chain fatty acids. So basically, their job is to break down the fatty acids. 
part of the problem is that they produce H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide will kill cells. You might have some at home that will, you know, use for disinfectant. Uh, I went to the dentist uh, recently, and they made me uh, rinse my mouth out with hydrogen peroxide just in case I had any disease in my mouth. Hopefully it would kill anything during the uh, exam so that there would be no contamination from me to my dental hygienist. So peroxisomes are very specific and basically um, they break down fatty acids. So those were the organelles. The last section of the four parts of the cell was the cell membrane or also known as the plasma membrane. And the cell membrane is made up of two types of lipids, two types of proteins, two types of carbohydrates. Okay, It has numerous functions and we're just going to narrow it down to five. Okay. Um, one is physical isolation, and the internal parts of the cell are physically isolated from the external parts of the cell. And that's important, you know, being separated from the external environments. Uh, support structure. Uh, the embedded proteins and cholesterol help to provide support structure and maintain the cell's three-dimensional shape. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, cells provide a semi-permeable barrier. Uh, the composition of especially the phospholipid bilayer regulates entry and exit of most substances in and out of the cell. Um, and in order to go directly across, you need to be small and nonpolar, which is actually a good thing. Uh, we only had four basic themes of physiology, but one of the um, uh, things you could add if we we're going to add a, a, an extra theme or two would be control. And Having control over what gets in or out of the cell is uh, extremely important in terms of how we function. So don't feel bad for the cell because it can, you know, only a few things can move across. It's actually good for the cell because now we can regulate that and we have more control. And we'll talk about this a couple times in the semester where sometimes we give something up to get more of something else. And oftentimes we give something up to get more control. And so... Uh, that's a great example of that in terms of the semi-permeable barrier. Uh, number four is um, communication. And so the cell membrane provides a staging area for receptors that allow uh, the exterior of the cell to communicate with the interior of the cell, basically. And so we have some receptors that are in direct contact with both the intracellular and extracellular fluid at the same time. So communication is an important component of that. And then separation of charge. This is really essential, especially what we call the excitable cells, the muscle and the nerve cells that allow us to uh, move electricity from one portion of our body to another or to allow a muscle to contract or a nerve impulse to, to be carried from one place to another. And so what the separation of charge does is allows us to regulate the ions that pass through uh, various channels. And that's important, as we'll see later when we talk about the nerve. Let's talk about the structural components of the cell really quick. Now, cells are a little more complicated now, but some of those things that we look at, like you might read about sphingolipids and lipid rafts, and to be honest, there's not a whole lot of difference functionally between a phospholipid and a sphingolipid. So until we figure out otherwise, you know, I think that it's probably easiest just to remember, there's two of the basic types of food you would worry about in your diet that make up the cell membrane. So there's two lipids, there's two proteins, and there's two carbohydrates. The lipid portions are the phospholipid bilayer, right? So they're similar to triglyceride, right? They have a glycerol molecule that's got two fatty acids, and instead of having the third fatty acid like a triglyceride would, uh, they have one phosphate molecule attached. Uh, they are amphipathic in nature. It means they're both hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time. They have polar and nonpolar ends. The polar end is what we call the glycerol head. That's a sugar alcohol. And the nonpolar portion are those fatty acid tails. Uh, because of the way they are um, 
uh, well, I guess the best way to say that because of the charge distribution, because they're amphipathic, uh, they arrange themselves with the heads facing to the interior, exterior of the cell, and the tails going both towards the middle. So sometimes they call that the HTTH arrangement or head, tail, tail, head arrangement. Um, Generally speaking, only water and small neutral or nonpolar molecules can pass directly across the membrane, primarily because of the phospholipid bilayer. Also, in human cells and animal cells in general, we also have cholesterol. Cholesterol is an important component that helps to stabilize the membrane, and it is a steroid precursor. So, uh, while we don't uh, use the cholesterol in the cell membrane to make a you know, molecule of testosterone or estrogen or aldosterone or something. Uh, certainly, uh, cholesterol is an important component of uh, our body, even though we try to watch what we eat in our diet, because excessive cholesterol can lead to cardiovascular disease. But uh, cholesterol is very uh, important in terms of, you know, making steroids. But also, in this case, its uh, importance is it's a structural component of the membrane. Uh, for proteins, you can divide the proteins up basically into two, what we call integral, some people say integral proteins. Um, they span through the, both the phospholipid layer and the uh, uh, polar portions as well. Um, they are generally amphipathic in nature because they span across the entire membrane. So as an example, they'll form a channel or a transport protein uh, that will help uh, polar molecules or larger molecules to pass through the membrane because they can't pass directly. All right. They also offer a level of structural support. You also have peripheral proteins. Now, peripheral proteins are found on the periphery, which means they're on the either inside or outside. They don't go totally across the membrane and are often embedded enzymes or cytoskeleton elements or things like that. So peripheral proteins tend to be more polar in nature because of where they're located. Uh, finally, we have the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are either your glycoprotein or glycolipid. Uh, glyco means carbohydrate, so glycoprotein is a carbohydrate attached to a protein, and the glycolipid is a carbohydrate attached to a lipid. And what's interesting about these is they always are on the external surface of the cell. And Primarily, they're used for cell-to-cell -cell communication and identification. Whether it's a glycolipid or glycoprotein, they're going to be on the external surface, and they uh, help to provide communication and identification. So that was question number two. Let's finish this video with question number three. Split it up. Oh, no, it doesn't finish number two. Um, I'm not going to go over this because we just did for the most part. But this is probably a good chart to understand. Kind of, kind of goes through each part and everything we talked about for the most part here. So this is a review, and I, I think literally we did all this. Um, we didn't talk about the nucleolus. The nucleolus, sometimes called the owl's eye because it stains dark in the nucleus, and its job is to make RNA, basically. Um, but I think everything else we talked about. Uh, so uh, this is a good chart and kind of... Uh, used to figure out things and maybe test yourself. Let's look at number three. Uh, number three is another long one. Um, it says, outline the methods of passive and active transport, how things can pass through the membrane. Okay, So let's kind of start out in a very general sense. Uh, passive transport uh, relies on the kinetic energy already within the system. So passive transport uh, uses the kinetic energy that causes a substance to move down their concentration gradient. If we provide more kinetic energy, either through heating or some physical, like stirring, um, passive transport's gonna increase. Uh, passive transport has substances that are always going from a high to low concentration or a high to low pressure. So they're going down some sort of gradient. Um, Passive transport can deal going uh, directly through a membrane, or it doesn't even need a membrane. Um, uh, you can have water, which is really a form of passive transport with osmosis. Uh, 
Uh, but when it moves across the membrane, it follows fixed law, which we'll talk about later. That's actually a whole question in the group problems on fixed law a little later. Um, and uh, you can also have a protein transporter. Uh, it's called facilitated diffusion, which moves things uh, across a membrane using a protein transporter. That's opposed to active transport. Active transport requires the input of energy from ATP. It does not have to be used directly. It can be indirect. We'll talk about what that really means when we get to secondary active transport. But we move molecules against a gradient in active transport. So they're going against a concentration gradient or against a pressure gradient. Right? Um, so active transport is considered to be a form of facilitated transport. Facilitated just means helped. So there's a protein moving in. But there's always some sort of energy expended somewhere, and there's always something moving against a gradient. So those are kind of the two requirements. So passive, no energy required, down a gradient. Active, energy required at some point in time against a gradient. All right. Now, not all things need a protein to move across the cell membrane, but if it does, we can kind of divide those proteins up into... Um, a couple different things. So the first would be a uniport or a uniporter. That's a protein that moves one type of molecule in one direction, right? Uni means one, right? So that's a transporter that moves one molecule one direction. Now we can have co-transporters. Those are actually fairly common. And a co-transporter moves multiple types of molecules at the same time. Right, it can go in both directions or only one direction. So a symport, again, sim means together, moves two or more different molecules in the same direction. So they don't have to be different types of molecules. It has to be physically um, uh, two different molecules, at least, right, in the same direction. So symport. An antiport moves two or more molecules in opposite directions. So one's moving inside a cell, the other one's moving outside the cell. That would be an antiport. Okay. So let's look at the primary passive transport mechanisms that we're responsible for in class. There are five. These five aren't the only five uh, primary passive transport mechanisms, but um, they are the ones that are most important for us. Now, the first one is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion doesn't require a membrane. And it's just movement of like substances from an area of high to low concentration or sometimes pressure. So you drop a bit of dye in water and it diffuses and eventually makes the water all the same color. That's simple diffusion. If we apply it to a membrane, though, it becomes a little more complicated. So diffusion through a membrane is movement of like substances through a semipermeable membrane from an area of high to low concentration or pressure. Right? Most times concentration, but it could be pressure, especially with gases like oxygen. It's actually pressure that moves across the membrane. So that follows something called Fick's Law. Um, Fick's Law we'll talk about later, but uh, basically Fick's Law tells us the net flux, which is the appearance of the molecules on the other side of the membrane. So as it moves across, the net flux is how fast the molecules appear on the other side is equal to the surface area times the concentration gradient divided by the membrane thickness times the membrane resistance. So um, fixed law is very important in terms of deter uh, determining how things move across the membrane. The next one is facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion, again, means that we're using some sort of protein in this case, although some people don't call it facility diffusion, uh, we can add channels. Uh, channel proteins are integral proteins that span the entire membrane. And how fast a molecule moves depends on a couple things. One is the number of channels present and whether those channels are open or not. Uh, in the section on this stuff in the normal chapter, we talked about channels and that a few channels have no gate, right? Uh, uh, one type of channel has two gates, but the vast majority of channels have one gate. If we open the gate, things move. If we close the gate, things don't. So um, 
how fast things move depend on the number of channels and whether those channels are open or not. Um, channels move things through very quickly. They are very specific. But, uh, you know, you can almost think of it as a continuous movement through the channel from one side of the memory to the other. Channels can never saturate. Um, that means that whenever you increase the concentration of a substance on one side of the membrane and it moves through the channel, it's going to increase the rate of diffusion. So as I keep on adding more and more and more of that substance, the diffusion keeps on going faster, 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 no matter what. Okay. Facilitated diffusion doesn't use channels, it uses transporters. And so the difference is the channel allows the substance to basically move by itself. And the facilitated diffusion uses a transporter which physically carries the substance across the membrane. And that protein is much slower. Okay, And because they're slower, it takes a lot longer to move things, relatively speaking, uh, across a membrane with a transporter than a channel. It's probably 10 times slower. Um, so, at least. Uh, so, uh, the other thing to remember about transporters, uh, the protein ones, which most of them are, um, have the characteristics of specificity, meaning that only specific things that fit into the channel Right, have the right three-dimensional shape, will be carried across. Uh, there are some transporters that carry, like, for instance, only glucose across, and there are other transporters that carry any six-carbon sugar across. So they're still specific because it's not going to carry a protein or a five-carbon sugar or uh, a lipid, right? So um, that's uh, specificity. Competition, we talked about a little bit. Uh, is when ligands compete for binding site. Uh, the competition is defined somewhat by the concentration gradient. The higher the concentration of a ligand, the more likely it is to bind, but also the affinity. Affinity is the attraction. The higher the attraction or affinity of a molecule for a binding site, the faster it's going to bind as well. Uh, the third characteristic is saturation. In terms of saturation, right, unlike channels, transporters can saturate. It means once I have all of my transporters full, I cannot speed up that reaction, that movement across the cell membrane, uh, because, you know, let's say I had 100 transporters and they're all full. It doesn't matter how much of the substance I have to transport. I can't do any more because they're all full. So they exhibit saturation as well. The last passive transport mechanism is called osmosis. Osmosis is a special case of water moving through a semi-permeable membrane. And this confuses students sometimes because water, just like all the other substances, moves from a high to low concentration. But the problem is we don't talk about the concentration of water. We talk about the concentration of solutes in the water. So as an example, if we had a 10% sodium chloride solution, we don't say it's 90% water solution. It is. But we say it's 10% sodium chloride. So the more solutes it has, the less concentrated the water is itself. So, you know, the good thing to remember is water moves to dilute. And water moves freely until it reaches osmotic equilibrium. Remember, water is a special case of polar molecules that can move directly across the membrane. Although nowadays we know that a significant amount of water movement goes through channels. Um, they're called aquaporins, water pores, water holes, aquaporins. So those are the passive transport mechanisms. Let's look at the active transport mechanism again. Um, a couple of them you probably already know. A couple of them are kind of new though. Um, so the first one for active transport is primary active transport. And primary active transport directly uses ATP for energy. And so it's got what's called an ATPase. So an ATPase, so when you see the word, or I guess the, the ASE ending, right, um, often tells us it's an enzyme, right? Like not always, like suitcase isn't an enzyme, right? Uh, 
But, you know, physiologically, you see that ASE ending tells you it's an enzyme. And the ATP tells us it's an enzyme that breaks down ATP. So primary active transport has this ATPase that allows ATP to use, be used directly. So we basically break up ATP. We break that loss, last phosphate off the ATP molecule and make it ADP, and that releases energy. And a great example of that is the sodium-potassium ATPase. And what that does is it maintains the electrical potential of the cell. And what happens is sodium is moved out of the cell against its gradient, while potassium is moved into the cell against its gradient. All right. Now, we actually move three sodiums out and two potassiums in at the same time. So it's an antiport. All right. We're moving five molecules, actually, in, in basically one turn of that uh, sodium-potassium pump or sodium-potassium ATPase. Um, there's only four uh, known primary active transporters in the human body. This is one of them. Um, and its job is to maintain what we call disequilibrium. And sometimes students have a problem with that concept. And, you know, I think if you think about it this way, it's not as hard as it sounds. Students all understand what equilibrium is. So if we, you know, had a reaction and, you know, it was reversible and A went to B or B went to A, if we put more A in, it would make B until it reached equilibrium and then we wouldn't have any net change in that. And then if we put more A in, it would do the same thing until it reached equilibrium. So students understand that equilibrium across the membrane means it's basically the same concentration inside as outside. So it's in equilibrium, pretty simple. Well, if it's not in equilibrium, if it's not equal across the membrane, it's in disequilibrium. And having things across the membrane that aren't equal is very helpful in terms of how we work physiologically. As a matter of fact, if most things were in equilibrium across the membrane, we'd be dead probably. Um, that's not true of osmolarity as an example, but of you know all of our ions, they need to be higher on one side of the membrane than the other. So that's um, important. So that's what primary active transport does for us. Now secondary active transport is a little different. It's still moving something against a gradient. It's still requiring energy. But secondary active transport gets its name because it's secondary to primary active transport. It means it's a consequence of primary active transport. And what it does is it uses the energy created, basically the, the gradients, the disequilibrium, um, so to fuel the movement of a molecule down a gradient. And at the same time, it couples it with moving a molecule against a gradient. Okay, so we still have that requirement. We've expended ATP, not at this time, but earlier to create the disequilibrium. And we're still moving one thing against a gradient. And so that's why it's called secondary active transport. A good example of that is this, what we call the sodium glucose transporter. And what it does is it moves sodium down a gradient. It diffuses in down its gradient. But at the same time, basically, think of it as glucose hitchhiking on sodium and sodium pulling it in when glucose doesn't have a concentration gradient into the cell. So glucose is going against a gradient while sodium is moving with a gradient. So that's the secondary active transport. Uh, the other two would be endocytosis. Endocytosis, endo means in, cytosis refers to cell, right? So endocytosis is the process of bringing a uh, particle or a liquid or something else inside the cell. So from outside to inside the cell. Um, it requires ATP, it doesn't directly use it. And there's three types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. In phagocytosis, it's also known as cell eating. The cell membrane engulfs a substance, a solid substance, basically, and it's absorbed into the cell as it forms a vesicle. Penocytosis is similar, but by definition, it engulfs a drop of fluid. So solids, phagocytosis, fluids, penocytosis. Both are non-specific responses, but we can get much more specific in a process called receptor-mediated endocytosis. Again, since it's a receptor, it's going to have that specificity, right? It has to have that three-dimensional shape. 
And what happens typically is something binds on the outside to the cell surface uh, on a receptor and the entire complex, the receptor and the substance that bound to it is brought into the cell. And so it's, it's much more specific. So that's endocytosis. Exocytosis is similar, except exo exit, right? Removing things to the outside of the cell is basically what that means. And again, what happens is the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and release the contents out of the cell. Um, generally speaking, uh, even though we have phagial and pinocytosis or pinocytosis, however you want to say it, um, as part of endocytosis, uh, normally, they don't distinguish between liquids and solids for exocytosis, which is kind of uh, interesting. And again, it requires ATP, but doesn't directly use it. Uh, this chart is probably not a bad thing to look at and kind of understand uh, for the exam. It kind of explains a lot of the, the factors we'd want to go into. All right, so we're going to stop this and move to a second video for the last couple of questions on the group problems for lecture exam one.